Solving general chemistry problems. Thermodynamics. A common question in general chemistry involves a bomb calorimeter. Consider a bomb calorimeter at 21.55 degrees Celsius loaded with 3.5 grams of benzoic acid and the chamber is pressurized to 10 bar with oxygen gas. The enthalpy of combustion of benzoic acid is minus 3228 kilojoules per mole. Following ignition, the temperature rises to 25.75 degrees Celsius. What is the heat capacity of the calorimeter? This question amounts to calibrating a calorimeter. The equation that is used for calorimetry is quite simple. Q is equal to C delta T, where Q is the heat flow that flows between the system being studied and the surroundings. C is the heat capacity of the calorimeter, and delta T is the temperature changes that are observed. A calorimeter is calibrated by combusting a substance with a known enthalpy of combustion. This allows us to calculate the expected energy that will be released and which will flow into the calorimeter. We will measure the change in temperature and we can, from that, determine the calorimeter's heat capacity. The standard we use here is benzoic acid. We are given its molar enthalpy of combustion and the mass used. We must find its molar mass to convert the 3.5 grams into moles of benzoic acid. Looking it up, we find it to be 122.177 grams per mole. Our calculations will therefore be 3.50 grams divided by 122.177 grams per mole is 0 0.02865 moles. Note that I'm carrying some extra significant digits through these intermediate calculations. The heat flow associated with the system then is 0 0.02865 moles times a minus 3228 kilojoules per mole, which is a minus 92.47 kilojoules. Here now is the key concept when using a calorimeter. The heat flow associated with the calorimeter is the opposite sign of that associated with the system. If heat flows out of the system, it must flow into the calorimeter. So in this case, the calorimeter heat flow is positive 92.47 kilojoules. The observed temperature change is just the final temperature minus the initial temperature, or 25.75 minus 21.55, or 4.20 degrees Celsius. By rearranging the calorimetry equation to solve for C, we have it equal to Q over delta T, or 92.47 kilojoules, divided by 4.20 degrees Celsius, which gives 22.0 kilojoules per degree Celsius. This is the heat capacity of the calorimeter and is the answer to the problem. Note the units involved. There is no per mole or per gram. This is the heat capacity of a thing, the calorimeter. It is built of steel and aluminum and plastic and contains a large quantity of water and air and a thermometer and so on and so on. Remember that per gram is a useful distinction for a uniform yet complex substance such as wood or concrete, and per mole is a useful description for a uniform pure substance such as water or gold. Now here are some things that might have surprised some people. The sign of the heat flow is something that needs to be understood. The system being studied is the 3.5 grams of benzoic acid, the portion of the oxygen gas that reacts with it, and the CO2 and H2O produced. The system is exothermic, that is why the reaction enthalpy is negative, and heat leaves the system, as indicated by the negative sign of Q system. But the experiment does not measure the properties of the system. It measures the temperature of the surroundings, and the calorimeter is the surroundings. So heat that leaves the system must enter the surroundings, and the sign of that heat transfer must be changed. We measure an increase in temperature due to a positive flow of heat into the calorimeter, but that heat came out of the system. So we report a negative heat flow out of the system. The system had a negative enthalpy of reaction. Now here's another thing that might have caught you off guard. Did you notice that the molar mass of benzoic acid was reported as 122.177 U? Did you know that that U was not a typo? That is one of the correct ways of reporting molar mass. We might have also said 122.177 AMU, or 122.177 grams per mole, or 122.177 Daltons. Why the various units? Well, in the first half of the 20th century, chemists and physicists each had their own related but slightly different ways of determining the mass 
<clears throat> of atoms and molecules. They were referred to as atomic mass units and were given as ratios to a different standard reference atomic species. In those uh, early days, the difference was not too important. But as the experiments improved and precision increased, we had to get together on things. So they did get together and agreed upon a new reference standard. It was the carbon atom, specifically with six protons and six neutrons, and gave it the new name of Unified Atomic Mass Unit, and given the new symbol of U. Strictly speaking, when someone uses AMU, they should be referring to the old standard and should, should use U for the modern standard. But today, everyone is exclusively using the new standard, and even AMU most certainly means the Unified Atomic Mass Unit System. And then what is this Dalton unit? In recent years, it's been promoted as the best unit for atomic and molecular mass. It has had the identically same value as U. It has been adopted more readily in biochemical fields where large proteins can have masses in the kilodalton or even megadalton range. The Dalton seems to employ the prefixes such as kilo or mega more readily you know, for saying kilo unified atomic mass unit rather than kilodalton seems rather awkward. However, as of the 20th of May 2019, the governing body for the Système International, SI, has redefined the most basic constants and it appears that there may now be a very slight difference, but nothing significant for questions in general chemistry. Essentially, you may see all of these used during this class and even during your future scientific career, but know that Dalton is the preferred professional term, but U and AMU will still be used in practice and they are effectively the same as the Dalton. Now, I'd also like to make a comment about chemical reactions in general. Too often, you will see someone displaying an image of a molecule that shows it blowing apart when the bond is breaking. This is supposed to represent a chemical reaction, and this is erroneous. Every chemical reaction must begin with energy going into a bond, not coming out. There must always be a barrier to reaction, otherwise the reactant molecule would never exist. It would always just fall into products. There must be an injection of energy. It might come from collisions with the wall or with other molecules, or it might absorb a photon of light, but something must initiate the reaction leading to a bond breaking. Look at this graph. It shows a simplified evolution of energy during a chemical reaction, going from reactants to products. The reaction begins with the reactants with their initial equilibrium energy, given the temperature. As the reaction proceeds, the internal energy must increase as the molecule distorts and begins to break apart. Then the new product bonds form, and the system relaxes to its new equilibrium level as product molecules. If the reactants absorb more energy at the beginning than the products give up at the end, the overall reaction is endothermic. If they give off more energy than they use, it is exothermic. So let me remind you of what happens when a reaction occurs and ends up being either exothermic or endothermic. This is the reaction upon which this problem was based, the combustion of benzoic acid, the reaction between benzoic acid and oxygen. The reactants start off with energy in their motion that is consistent with the starting temperature of the system. In their random motions, a collision occurs with sufficient energy to start the reaction. In the case of the bomb calorimeter, we create a hot spot with the hot filament which initiates the reaction. At the instant following reaction, the product bonds form and leave much more energy in the products. They move around wildly. Then the energy is distributed amongst the new degrees of freedom and excess energy is transferred out of the system by collisions and radiation, finally bringing the product molecules back to thermal equilibrium but much more heat was shed in this last step than was consumed in the initiation step. The reaction is overall exothermic. By contrast, we can consider an endothermic reaction. An example would be the solvation of a salt such as ammonium chloride. Again, the reactant molecules come with an amount of motion consistent with being in thermal equilibrium at the starting temperature. Then the energy comes in from collisions and is absorbed in the breaking of bonds. New product bonds are formed, and the products have residual energy from the formation process. Now that energy is again distributed over the new degrees of freedom, and some is shed to the surroundings. But more was absorbed than was shed, so the reaction is overall endothermic. 
These product bonds must always, at least at the instant of being formed, have more energy in them than they can have and keep the atoms bound together. They must lose some energy, again by collisions or radiation, and they must do so quickly. It is also important to realize that it is not only the total amount of energy that is important, but it is also essential to appreciate how that energy is spread over the possible modes of motion, which we call degrees of freedom, of the molecules. This is entropy. If a molecule has more degrees of freedom than another, then it can absorb more energy than the other in reaching the same temperature. We say it has a greater heat capacity.